agree that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. I have a dream. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. Every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain. And the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is a faith that I go back to the south with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. With new meaning, my country tears of thee. Sweet land of liberty of thee, I say. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrims' pride. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. We will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Hey Bremen City family, we are so thankful that you're with us today. I know that we couldn't be together in person, but I'm so thankful for the opportunity to gather together like this where we can still pray together, we can still worship together, we can still look at God's Word together, and even share in communion together. As most of you know, Monday is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. It's an opportunity for us as a nation to stop and to celebrate the life of this man, but more than the life, the fight that he was fighting, the fight that we're still fighting, the fight that Jesus was fighting. Many things, before they're ever a political issue, or even a humanitarian issue, they're a gospel issue. They're a Bible issue. Jesus cared for the sick unlike anyone else. Jesus cared for the poor unlike anyone else. And Jesus came dividing and, and breaking down these dividing walls that people had put up that we can't associate with these people or those people. But he came to create one people, one kingdom under one banner. And that banner is his name. In Revelation chapter 5, we get this picture of heaven. And in this moment, it says this, Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you, talking about Jesus, to take the scroll, to open its seals. It says this, here's the reason that Jesus was found worthy. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. What it's saying is that Jesus shed his blood for all people so that he could create one people. And he has called us here on earth to model what we will be in heaven. People from all kinds of nations, people of all colors, people of all uh, languages, people from all different backgrounds, so that we could be one people sharing in something common, and that's that we were lost and He found us, that we were blind and now that we can see. 
And Jesus has called us to continue that fight, showing love to all people. And I hope that we can be a shining example of that. I'd love to take a moment. We're about to take a time of uh, worship together, but I'd also love to take a moment to pray for us that we could carry on that same fight uh, for a unified people that Jesus was fighting, that Martin Luther King Jr. was fighting. And uh, would you pray with me? Well, Jesus, we thank you for the words of Scripture that you were slain. You were killed. You were put on a cross. You shed your blood, not for one specific group of people, but for all people, because you have made all people, and all people are made in your image. And Lord, I pray that you would help us at Bremen City Church to be a shining example of that to the world, not ignoring the fact that we're different, but in the recognition of our differences, recognizing what brings us together. And that is that we belong to you. So God, would you unify us and help us be an example of love to others that many could come to know you. Thank you for this time together. Would you come and meet us wherever we are? Would you speak to us this morning? Would you center our hearts on you? We love you. We give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks, church. Let's worship together. Good morning, everyone. We're so excited to worship from our homes with you, the original church. Uh, and we're here, and we're going to start worship a little bit differently than we normally do, uh, with just dwelling on and meditating on the Word of the Lord this morning. And we've, we've read the Scriptures in worship before, but we really believe that that uh, when Jesus said that He is the Word, that that was true, it, that in the Word there is life. And when we dwell and we meditate on it, that the Lord reveals Himself to us. And we're just going to take a moment to do that this morning. And in these 21 days of delight, we've just been reading through the book of John. And so we're going to read today's John 15. We're just going to put up on the screen John 15, verses 16 and 17. And I just want to encourage you to just look at those words with your family, by yourself, wherever you are. Just look at those words and just say, Holy Spirit, just reveal yourself to me. Holy Spirit, Lord, just reveal Yourself to me. Something new through these scriptures, through these words that I'm reading, Lord Jesus. Let them be more than just words. Let them be life to my soul. God, Your Word is a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path, Lord Jesus. So we just press in. So just over the next 60 seconds, as, we, as, we're, read, as uh, we're just playing, just say, God, reveal Yourself to me.
worship of dwelling with you, God, of being with you, of delighting in you, God. So here we are, Lord. We thank you, God. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. We have two special things we're going to do for kids before our sermon. We're going to play a game, and we're going to go over our memory verse. So if you're a kid, come on! It is cold outside. Ooh, that means it's the perfect time to play one of my favorite winter games. Hot cocoa? No, no. It's super easy to explain, but hard to win if you're not paying attention. I'll show you several cups of delicious hot cocoa. One of these cups will not be so delicious though, because it's made with salt instead of sugar. <laughs> the cups will then get shuffled up, but your challenge will be to keep your eye on the salty cup. Think you can do it? Great, let's get started. Okay, shout out one, two, or three, if you think you know which cup is definitely a no-no. Great job, everyone. Let's try another one. This one will be a little faster. Whoa, that was fast. Did you keep track of the salty cocoa? If so, shout it out. One, two, or three, if you think you know which cup it is. Well done! <laughs> Let's try another one. This time with four cups of cocoa. That was definitely a little more challenging. Shout out the number if you think you know which cup it is. Nice job! Now, let's try it again. But this time, the cups are gonna move a little faster. Okay, that, that was pretty tricky. Uh, did you keep your eye on the cup? If so, shout it out. One, two, three, or four. Way to go! That, that was impressive, but what happens if we add in one more cup of cocoa? Wowzers! Does anybody know which cup has the salt in it? Shout it out if you know it! Nice job. Uh, can you keep your eye on the cup if they're going crazy fast? Oh my! I, I, I think we might have spilled some cocoa on that one. Uh, does, does anybody know which one is the salty cup? Wow! Anybody who could keep their eye on that one must really love hot cocoa. Great job, everybody. I hope you did good. Now, let's go over our memory verse. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. God's power has given us everything we need to lead a godly life. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. God's power has given us everything we need to lead a godly life. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. God's power has given us everything we need to, to lead a godly life. Great job, everyone. It's time for the segment. So get your Bibles and let's go. All right, Bremen City family, we're going to share in God's Word for a few minutes together before taking communion as kind of the final thing that we do together. If you want to grab your Bible or turn to uh, where we're going to be reading from or pull it up on your phone, we're going to be in John chapter 11, reading about the story of Lazarus. And then I have five quick uh, points from the story of Lazarus I want to share with you. 
It's interesting because as we've been doing 21 Days of Delight, I've taken a few of those opportunities to read through whatever chapter in John that we're in with my boys. Because uh, a lot of times if we don't have sports going late at night or things like that, we'd love to read together and usually do a devotional and then uh, read something else. And so as I've been reading through those full chapters, it's not often that I read through full chapters with my children. Uh, and I understand that it's hard sometimes for them to comprehend because the Bible is so rich, so full, but I found a lot of value in it as well. And so I, I want to encourage you, we're going to read John chapter 11 and then a little bit of John chapter 12 to get Lazarus's full story. And uh, this is a great one to follow along with. And it's interesting too, because in the Old Testament, when Israel used to gather together, there were times that they would read through the law, the book of Moses, uh, together as an assembly. And I used to think like, man, how long were they there standing out, you know? So thankfully, you're in your living room, in your bedroom, something like that. You got a comfortable place. John chapter 11 is where we're going to read. And I'd encourage you to follow along with me. I'm reading out of the ESV, the English Standard Version. Uh, but whatever you're reading out of, you should be able to follow along just fine. All right, let's read together. In John chapter 11, starting in verse 1, it says, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, or teacher, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he's going to get better. He'll recover. And Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe but let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me Though he dies, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to weep there. 
Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept him from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he's been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we going to do? This man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and for the nation only, not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Jesus therefore no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness, to a town called Ephraim, and there he stayed with his disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think? that he will not come to the feast at all. Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know, so they might arrest him. We're getting close to the end of Lazarus' entire story. Chapter 12. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for three hundred denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. Last paragraph. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. There is so much within that. 
And as we've been walking through 21 Days of Delight, as we've been reading through the book of John, several times I've posted on social media some of my thoughts as we've been reading through that. And I had a few of them on that one. But uh, as much as I want to get into some of those, I have five things about Lazarus I want to bring to you really quickly. Here's the first thing. The first thing is that Lazarus was loved by Jesus. When it came to Jesus that Lazarus was sick, it states that Lazarus cared about him. And over and over we see through this story, now we understand that God loves all of us. John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world. But there's something special about the Bible giving clear account about a specific person that Jesus showed affection for. And I think that it helps us because we can kind of put us, ourselves in that place. That Jesus, yes, he loves everyone, but sometimes it means something different when you really have this understanding that not just in the crowd, but you. Jesus loves you. Jesus sees you. Jesus formed and fashioned you and planned good works for you and built purpose into you and gave you gifts and he has a divine destiny for you and he placed you on this planet at this time for a reason. And so Jesus loved Lazarus, but Jesus loves you. Here's the second thing that I notice. Lazarus was dead. Lazarus is very much a picture of us. Lazarus was in the grave. He was dead. And the Bible makes it very clear that we as people are dead in our sin. I'm breathing right now, right? <laughs> yes, I'm breathing, okay? Before I knew Jesus, the Bible makes it clear I was a dead man walking because I was still in my sin. I was still guilty of my sin. I had broken God's law. I had decided that I was going to live my way and we are born into the world that way. And if you are a, a child or you are a teenager or a preteen and you have parents that love Jesus and have been raising you up to love him as well, you are blessed. If you are a young person and you're watching this right now, you are blessed because you had this opportunity for God to grab a hold of your heart now while you're young. But even you who may be in love with Jesus as a child, when you were born, you were born in sin. And so we were dead and apart from God. But here's the beautiful thing. Jesus shows up and he raises Lazarus from the dead. He called out to Lazarus by name, Lazarus, come out. Do you know that Jesus says the same thing to you? Maybe you didn't hear those exact words, but when you sense that Jesus is making you aware that yes, I have sinned, but he paid a price, he died for me, he's the only one that can call me out of my sin, that he says the same thing to you. Insert your name, come out. Come out from the world, come out from your sin, come be a part of me. Did you know that's actually what the church is? The church, based on the biblical term, ecclesia, is people called out that God sees people in their sin, but calls them out to follow him, and we step out and belong to him now. And so today, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, what he's saying to you is, come out. Come out from where you are. Come out from living for yourself. Come out from being your own God. Come out from your sin and come be a part of me. Come be a part of my family. And when Jesus called Lazarus out, here's another point with Lazarus' story. When Jesus called Lazarus out of the grave, Lazarus was still wrapped in these grave clothes. And I remember, I vividly remember the first time I heard a pastor teach on this. 
uh, somebody who's been a very dear friend, very, very dear encouragement to my life. He was actually the uh, lead pastor of the first church that Charity and I served at when we got married in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, pastor Jack Moon of Southside Assembly of God. Uh, just a wonderful man of God. But I remember him preaching on this story. And he was the first one to bring to my attention that Lazarus was called out of the tomb, but still wrapped in these grave clothes. And that Jesus gives a command for the grave clothes to be removed. And I remember him sharing on this idea of the grave clothes. And here's the reality. When we come to know Jesus, he calls us out. He takes us from death to life. But there is a process of looking more and more like Jesus. When we believe in Jesus, we are seen by God not based on our sin, but based on what Jesus did for us on the cross. So that when God looks at us now and sees Jesus, we're not guilty of our sin anymore because Jesus paid for it. We are redeemed. We are righteous in the eyes of God. The Bible calls us holy and dearly loved. It calls us saints. It calls us ministers to God. But as you know, as well as I know, there is still stuff in my heart that God has to deal with. And as we continue walking in our relationship with Jesus, as we continue walking through God's Word, we become more and more like Jesus. And so the same way that Lazarus came out of the grave alive, called out by Jesus, he still had grave clothes. And what I love too in this story is that Jesus commands others to take the grave clothes off, off of him. The reality is that we need one another. We are called to love and serve one another through the good and the bad. And we need one another to help take each other's grave clothes off. It is in living in biblical community, even when we butt heads sometimes. Because what the enemy wants is us to butt heads and part ways. Don't talk to each other anymore. Just go to separate churches. And whatever your story may be, I'm just saying that there is so often God calls us to work through conflict together because as we do that, we see parts of ourselves that maybe we would never seen before. And if we can keep working through those things together, forgiving one another, bearing with one another, loving one another, serving one another, encouraging one another, that we become more like Christ. And these grave clothes we live in, these grave clothes sometimes of selfishness, sometimes of pride, sometimes of greed, whatever they may be, anger, these grave clothes that we find ourselves wearing, sometimes still wrapped up in, that we need one another to help remove some of those grave clothes as we walk in community and follow Jesus together. What I love is after Lazarus was raised from the dead, I have two more things for you. That after Lazarus was raised from the dead, we find him several days later sitting with Jesus, being with Jesus. I can only imagine it had to have been a profound experience in his life for what, what happened and what he got to experience with the Lord. And God has so many experiences for you. But I love that he sat with Jesus. And God has called us, and that's one of the things we've been trying to encourage through 21 Days of Delight, is walking with Jesus, sitting with Jesus, delighting in worship, delighting in prayer, delighting in the scriptures. Because there's something transformational, something soul-filling, soul-fulfilling about sitting with Jesus. And I'm telling you, if we can't learn to sit with Jesus, we will not be able to walk with Jesus. And that's really the last place we see Lazarus. Lazarus was walking with Jesus. And it's interesting because not only did they seek to kill Jesus, because he was disrupting a lot of their systems, making a lot of things uncomfortable for the religious leaders, but they wanted to kill Lazarus too because of his testimony, because there were people coming to Jesus because of Lazarus. And I want to tell you, it is a blessing. You have a target on you from an enemy because you belong to Jesus and through your life, 
God wants your children and your friends and your co-workers and the people that you encounter to be drawn to Jesus and he hates it. And so he wants to do everything he can to take you out. But I want to encourage you today that God, the same way that we have learned with our kids memory verse, that God has given us everything that we need. He's given us power to lead a godly life. And so today, tomorrow, as you lead that godly life, and as you have an enemy who doesn't want you to lead that life, just know there is more power in you through Christ than it is against you through the enemy. And walk with him and lead other people to him. I love the story of Lazarus. And I want to encourage you today, if you haven't put your faith in Jesus, if you haven't been called out of that grave, if you haven't taken the steps to start unwrapping those grave clothes, if you're not walking with Jesus, sitting with Jesus, I want to encourage you to make that decision today. Can we pray together? Jesus, thank you for the story of Lazarus. Lazarus, whom you loved, and you love us. If anybody needs to hear that today, Jesus, I pray they hear loud and clear, you love them. Father, I pray today for anyone who may be still stuck in their sin, that they would hear your voice the same way you called out to Lazarus. Come out. Come out and be a part of me. Come out from the world. Come out from the world's ways. Come out from being your own God and follow me. God, I pray that you would help us live with one another in community, love one another and lead one another and strengthen one another, encourage one another. God, bring the right people around in our lives to help us remove these grave clothes. Father, I pray you'd help us learn to sit with you, to recline at the table with you, to delight in your word, delight in prayer, delight in worship, because in that we can walk with you. And Lord, as we walk with you and fulfill everything you've called us to do, give us strength, Give us power to lead a godly life that the same way people came to know you through Lazarus, they'd come to know you through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, listen, we're going to close together as we often do uh, in communion, sharing the Lord's Supper. So I want to give you a chance as a family, uh, if you want to grab some juice and some bread, some milk and some cookies, uh, maybe you picked up these communion packets from the church yesterday that we made available. If you want to just take a moment and find something, we're going to give you about 60 seconds or so uh, to find some elements so we can share in communion together and we'll come back and uh, take communion together and then we'll be done. chapter 26 verse 26 now as they were eating Jesus took bread and after blessing it broke it and gave it to the disciples and said take eat this is my body and he took a cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to them saying drink of it all of you for this is my blood of the covenant or of the promise which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus takes this opportunity to let the disciples know that Passover was going to mean something different, that he was going to be the sacrifice for sins. And so we celebrate this as we're instructed in the New Testament 
to continually remember what Jesus had done for us. And so I encourage you with your bread, with your cup, uh, let's take a moment to pray, reflect, and celebrate what the Lord has done for us uh, through the Lord's Supper, through communion. Well, Jesus, we don't take this lightly. It's not just a ritual to us. It's a remembrance. We remember that on an evening you sat with your disciples and you told them, I'm about to give my life for you. My body, my blood will be broken and spilled for you. And so God, the same way that you took of the bread and you broke it and you took of the cup and you drank it, as did your disciples, we do the same until one day you will return for us. We love you. Thank you for the life you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. You can take of your elements. Well, listen, we love you. Thank you for being with us today. I hope it's uh, been soul filling for you just to take a moment um, to worship the Lord, to get into his word, to share in communion. Uh, we are fully intending to be back with youth on Wednesday night and be back together in person next weekend. If there's anything you need, please don't hesitate to reach out. We love you. We celebrate you. We'll see you soon.